Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome once again. I hope you had a lovely evening. And today we're having the language diversity panel. We'll have presentations from uh, three different Wikimedians. Um, so firstly, I'll invite Mia. Uh, she's an Indonesian language teacher for foreigners. She joined Javanese Wikipedia in 2017. And now she's a contact person for the Yogyakarta uh, Wikimedia community. She's currently interested in Wiktionary and Wikisource. So Mia, I would like to invite you <clears throat> for your presentation. Morning, everyone. Okay, I'm Mia Sarjana. I'm a Wikimedia contact person for Javanese Wikipedia community. I'm a contact person Okay, so good morning. So I'm Mia from Indonesia and I live in Yogyakarta. Later, I will show you my island. Okay, so this is uh, my project, my personal project. So it's called Wiki Suara. So basically, it's just simple audio documentation in Japanese dictionary. So uh, my name is Mia and my username is Kunir Asam. So actually, Kunir means uh, Kurkuma and Asam is Tamarin. So it's just like a uh, beverage. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is the island of Java Island. So I live here in Yogyakarta. So it's quite um, far from Jakarta, it's eight hours by train or car. And uh, Wiki Suara, it comes from Wiki and Suara. Suara means voice in Japanese. And um, this is a Wikimedia in Indonesia online scholarship in April and May uh, last year because uh, was, I was got locked in my flat so I couldn't go out and I couldn't go to my house so I decided to take this um, grant to personal project. Yeah, so uh, Didi Kempot uh, was a singer in Indonesia and very famous. Uh, he sings Japanese language, but um, I just realized that the one of his uh, popular song is uh, called Chidro, the title, but I just realized that Chidro, uh, C-I-D-R-O, this is not standard word. So, when I check in C Lang Library Japanese, yes, so Chidro using O doesn't appear. So actually, Chidro using A is the standard word. So that is a common uh, mistake in Japanese people. So mostly um, people just write not in standard word because the sound O, O is just like flexible so it's uh so in japanese it doesn't have any particular rules which word using o in written or using a something like that so this is just common mistake but because i'm a teacher so i'm teaching japanese language for foreigners too so when foreigner learn japanese so maybe they will be confused so i think um dictionary is very important nah. This is just example. Um, the meaning is very, uh, the meaning and the written word is very important. For the first sentence, it's bojoku loro. Okay, so it means that my husband is sick. Okay, and then for the second one, it's bojoku loro means my husband is true. So I have two husbands. Okay, <laughs> so. It must be uh, should be careful to uh, write something. So maybe if we speak, it's loro and loro, like it's very uh, clear to be heard. But when it's come to return, so be careful. I don't have two husbands. I just only have one. <laughs> okay. So um, I just uh. Uh, review when I was in uh, university, so I know the Swedish work list. So I decided to check the Swedish work list in, in Japanese dictionary. And then this is the basic steps in my uh, project. So 
Uh, the first one is the preparation, recording, and publication. So the first one is about the research and check, and then you have the, te the template and the pages, and then recording my voice. But don't expect I will uh, go to the re record audio like fancy things. No, I will show you. <laughs> and then uh, uploading to comments, and then attach them, attach them in dictionary. So the first one. I checked the Swedish work list um, and I found and I realized that um, not all vocabularies in Japanese is available in our language. Uh, I will show later. And then I decided to add uh, some vocabularies uh, in uh, taste topic. It's like uh, spicy, um, sweet, something like that. And then I use this dictionary. Uh, sastra.org so this website is very awesome if you visit it's very awesome yes so uh, one of the popular dictionary uh, it's written by Purwo Derminto so it's very old dictionary but I think in uh, many people in Japanese volunteers also using this dictionary Yes, and also I was tidying up the templates because actually there's no rules or maybe there's no convention which uh, template is uh, standard in Japanese dictionary. So I asked Mas Chahyo. Uh, so Chahyo is staff in Wikimedia Indonesia and he helped me so much for this project and um, he proposed to use uh, this template. So it would be same. And then moving pages because um, actually uh, the government who work for the language uh, thing in my city, uh, it has, um, they changed the role of the diacritic, like the alphabet, uh, the alphabet sound, sorry, the vocal sound. So I just moved to use the new roles moving pages and then maybe this is you expect from me like using the fancy headphone and fancy microphone and I go to the soundproof room yeah <laughs> or maybe oh this is me when I'm teaching so I use my headphone that just the standard thing but the but I tried many microphone for that and this man reality. So my phone actually is the best microphone that I've ever tried. Even I um, I wear my husband's headphone, like the gaming headphone, and the and the microphone is not good. So I use my Samsung voice recorder, and then this is just my bedroom uh, when I uh, live alone. So it's not soundproof. So you know uh, the houses in Indonesia it's very close. So maybe my neighbor has chicken. So I should wait. <laughs> or maybe someone sells um uh, food. And yeah, it's very busy. So I should be patient. And then after that, I edit the. Uh, oh, this is yeah. This is uh Audacity software. So this is free and it's very simple, even for me, like as a beginner. So I trim the voice, like uh, to pay attention to the silent pauses at the beginning and in the end. And at that time, I learned so much from Google Translate, yeah, the sound. So I know oh, which one maybe it's um, proper, but I just have a feeling, so no rules. Yeah, not at all, just use feeling. Okay, maybe it's good, okay, I just get it. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that uh, the result of Samsung first recorder is not that loud when we uh, play it on laptop. So that's why I use effect amplify and set the number of the number bigger. So um, when um, user will play it on laptop and maybe their speaker on the laptop is low, it still be heard. Yeah, so it's uh, the amplifier. 
question. And then uh, Jahyo told me that I should change the extension. So the sound is should be OGG on comments. So I should uh, export all the file. And then uploading documents in the comments. So yeah, I want to present you my sound. Don't expect too much my voice because I'm not voice over. So <laughs> yeah, just tend to listen. Okay. okay, so maybe I will uh, try to uh, present the difference of A sound, yeah, for example. This one. Yeah, so it's a. Uh. And how about this? Okay, and then this is my okay, and then the last one I will present you. It's very nah, this one. This is main sun. So mean. see, so it has it has three e here, and the sound is very uh different. So me. Yeah. So that's very uh different. See. Yeah. That's all. You can visit the pages to hear my voices. Okay. Go back to presentation. Okay. And then this is just uh using the code like to make it same. Yeah, this is the challenge. So the uh, vocabulary is like not all not all available in Japanese, and one of them is frozen. Yeah, because maybe there's no snow, that there's no winter in in Java, so there's no vocabulary of frozen. And then the diacritics and tempest is not same, so I should moving up and I should tidying up. And then of course the tools, the recorder and the recording venue is very important. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a suggestion. So I hope uh, there will be a meeting or consensus in Japanese dictionary, so we can uh, do together like same template. Yeah. If you have any uh, suggestion for me, maybe if you work in some documentation, you can contact me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noor. Um, we have a. Uh... That's a beautiful presentation, by the way. Really amazing project. We'll uh, can you just wait here? Maybe we can, we have any questions. We'll just take uh, one or two questions. Anyone? Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it sounds totally amazing. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you've experimented with using Lingua Libre. The uh, yeah, yeah yeah I heard about them, but I haven't tried. Ah cool. Yeah yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, then. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. Yeah, thank you all. And next, I would like to invite Venus. She's a longtime Wikimedian, has been in the movement for more than 10 years. And uh, she's interested in open education, GLAM, and open data. And today, she's going to talk about language diversity with us. Venus. Thank you. First of all, I want to say that I'm not that old. I am experienced, but I'm not that old. So. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I'm Venus, originally from Hong Kong. So today I will be talking about um, wiki language and how we can speak to those outside the community. So um, like Sadip said, I have been like a like in the community for more than 10 years. So I was also working a bit um, for the outreach in Hong Kong. So um, I want to ask you guys one question before I uh, start the whole presentation. Have any of you never added on Wikipedia like here? So I want to know if there are like any newcomers among us here. Okay, so we've got one. So have you heard of like Wikipedia before or like all the sister projects before? Yeah. Yes, okay. So um, let's start with the presentation. Have you ever been asked one of these following questions? Like these are my favorite ones, <laughs> like um, in the last 10 or like even 12 years. So for example, people would ask like, 
what can, what's his like Wikimedia or what is Wikimedia Foundation? I've never heard of it. Or like, oh, Wiki. So are you related to WikiLeaks? And I'm like, no. Or like they would say something like, oh, what do you mean you work for Wikipedia? So you get paid to edit all those articles there? Or they would say something like, oh, Wikimedia Foundation is an organization behind Wikipedia. So they create everything there and that's why we can read online or something like, oh, you edit on Wikipedia. So can you create an article about me? I want to be there. So this, these are real questions. I didn't make it up for this presentation, but really I got asked. So what exactly like the wiki language that I'm talking about here? Actually, it can be everything that we are talking about at this particular conference, because we are so experienced now, we are so used to everything in the community. So we talk about Wikipedia, Wikidata, Wikibase, um, everything. Um, so we are so used to the name, but imagine you have never heard of like, Wikidata, and someone just come to you and say, hey, I'm working for Wikidata, how would you feel? Or like, how does it sound like to you? Or like some kinds of like vocabulary that like we are so used to with our own interpretation that might not be like um, uh, for those who are not from our community to understand. So one example that I would like to talk about is the word scholarship. So I assume that like some of us like who are here now for this conference, we got the scholarship to come here. So how we understand the word scholarship here is some kind of sponsorship or money that we can apply to attend some um, wiki conference or wiki event, which covers our like travel, like flights, accommodation or registration fee. But when we talk about the word scholarship in general, I think that like most, like for most people in all over the world, they would think about something related to their study, to something related to academia. So maybe you can get a scholarship to go to university. It will cover like your tuition or like some kind of like expenses like uh, when you're like a student. So I would say that like it actually like shows some kind of gaps between us, like Wikipedia, and also outsider when we talk about like language, like from from this perspective. Imagine like people uh, would come and buy scholarship because they think that oh, this is for my study. Um, I'm saying this because I um, have been working with a scholarship committee for Wikimania since 2016. And almost every year, we would get some kind of application saying like, oh, I need the money to support my study so that I can have a bright future. But this is not what our scholarship is for. Of course, I appreciate that people are fighting for every opportunity to support their study, but this is not what like Wikimedia scholarship is for. Then also there would be another problem because we use the word scholarship. So imagine there would be, let's say, a potential partner who is interested in open data and he or she can be like a perfect um, contact that we can make, like we can connect with. And then he or she see the word, oh, scholarship. It must be something about like study. It must be something about like academia. So why should I care about it? So they just don't read about it. But then actually this person uh, would be eligible for this scholarship and come to like our meetings or like conference or events to share like their expertise. So this is like something that I realized that we um, have in our community now, especially when we try to like do our outreach um, and try to make new connections. And especially when we talk about in the ESAP region, a lot of people, I'm not saying like here, like we people, but also about like the outsider that they don't really understand Wikipedia itself. And imagine like all the wordings that I was using like uh, so far with Wikidata, Wikibase, Wikibooks, and it's really difficult to approach like um, them because like they don't understand the idea of the community. They don't understand the idea of like all the projects. And then also like people are not like familiar with like our mm. language when we talk about sister project. And then people will ask me like, what do you mean sister project? So women can come, like only women can come. So this is true. Like people are asking like questions like this. Imagine like um, yesterday we had our first day of the conference. We kept talking about like sister projects, Wikidata. And still there are people who have no idea what we are talking about like here. So um, 
when we talk about the language itself, I would say that it's not just about language. It's also about our value and our mission. We keep talking about free knowledge. We keep talking about everyone can edit. Can we actually convince people like to do this while they don't really understand what we are talking about when we keep using all these type of technical terms or jargons that we have been using so far? I'm not saying that like now we should like abandon all the wordings that we are using in the community because we also have to take care of the existing Wikipedians. So I assume like um almost like 90% of like attendees here, we are very familiar with all these jargons. Like I said, maybe like the idea of scholarship, like by the way I was talking about, but it doesn't mean that we have to change the whole thing completely. But I feel like it is necessary that we have to elaborate more to the newcomers to explain to them like in a clear way so that they can understand what exactly we are doing so that we can recruit more new people to join us. So what can we do? I actually don't have like a perfect solution here. I'm not like coming here and say like, hey, I have the best solution here. Just listen to me. No, this is not like what I'm trying to do. But I would like to take this opportunity like to share with um, you guys some uh, possible solution and then we can explore this topic together. Um, so maybe one of the things that we can do is to start with our education program. Because so far, like the Wikipedia education program, I feel like um, it focuses a lot on um, using Wikipedia and the sister projects at um, education tools for both educators and students. But how about like creating a sense of community, sharing like the truth behind our like uh, our community, like not just Wikipedia, but also like the community, like behind this website they are using every day with our next generation would that be also possible that like it's not just about editing but also teaching them like the value the people behind um the project and of course like at the same time we have to be patient and take this opportunity to explain to people who are interested in our project I know that sometimes it can be very frustrated when you try to make new connections and then you talk about like Wikipedia and then people just like, what are you talking about? I've never heard of this or like Wikipedia. So it's about WikiLeaks. I know it sounds very funny, but also it's very frustrated when you try to do all this type of outreach and then people just don't understand like what you're doing. But I would say that like be patient and take this um as an opportunity to share like what you have been doing in the community with people. We can see this as like a starting point of new connections. And thank you everyone for being here and please feel free to contact me if you would like to explore this topic together. So thank you. Thank you so much, Venus. Uh, any questions for Venus? We, we have time for a couple of questions or any comments. Thank you, Bunty. Rachel. There you go. Thank you, Satip. Hi, feel amazing presentations and also inside uh, totally resonated with me. I feel like you really voice out uh, what's inside my thinking. Um, and um, the global advocacy team also has been a struggle um, to explaining our model without dilating it to the external um, stakeholders, especially parliaments, decision maker. Um, so we are actually thinking to make like a two pages uh very basic uh human language explanatory on what we are doing because um you know these kind of questions also come to me and one thing that um really affecting um security of our users are usually uh the decisions maker uh, always asking, uh, okay, so chapter is basically your branch in country level and they can um, change the content or a block and unblock user. So we want to demystify that, making sure that um, chapters, affiliates, volunteers are able to work safely in their country. So definitely we'll be in touch with you and hopefully can get feedback uh, from other community members as well about the, the one, two pages that we will be created. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. 
Uh, any closing comment on that, Venus? First of all, thank you, Rachel, for your comments. And then I want to ask you the question. So are you related to WikiLeaks? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That this is like a very common question. But also, I feel like, again, like there is another example while you were talking. I um, Another example popping up in my mind is like the word chapter that we are using a lot because we are using it to refer like the local uh, Wikimedia organization. But actually, when I talk about Wikimedia chapter, a lot of people think that chapter, so you mean like book chapter, like you guys writing a book or what? So um, I feel like there are lots of words that we are using now. It's not like we put wiki in it, but still like, it sounds like a normal English vocabulary, but still we have to explain to people. So maybe we can work on something um, together, like a vocabulary list so that people can really understand what it means like in our community. So that's all, thank you. Thank you so much. So next up, I would like to invite Jesse, user whisper to me. He's a coordinator for the Wikimedia Hong Kong user group. He has a, an affinity for computers and world cultures, and he has traveled throughout the world, especially Asia. And he lived for four years in Shenzhen, and that's when he collaborated a lot with the Hong Kong community. And he's going to uh, talk about the language diversity in Hong Kong and Chinese communities today. Jesse. Thank you, sir. Let me set, set up a little bit. My notes, sorry. I didn't prepare a, a PPT, so I apologize, but it was a long flight from Houston to Sydney. I really appreciate the, um, really appreciate the Sydney and, <clears throat> sorry, I appreciate being here in Sydney and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So let's talk about um, the China region. So what is the language of China? So when you get an idea, please raise your hand. What is the language of China? Thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> highest marks, right? So there is not just one Chinese. So you talk to a person on the street in the United States and they may go, oh, it's Chinese. But when you really look into the situation, you have to think, which Chinese? Yeah. Chinese can mean so many different things. Mm -hmm. And Chinese mm -hmm. has many varieties or in actuality, separate languages. So if you look at uh, mainland China, the language and media and education is standard written Chinese and standard spoken Chinese. Also note, it could be Putonghua or Guoyu or Huayu, depending upon what part of the Chinese speaking world you're in. But when you look at what languages people use in day-to-day -day life, they use a variety of spoken languages very similar to the linguistic breakdown in Europe. They are often um, not mutually, in, they use, you often cannot understand each other if you put two guys in a room and they speak together. Now, things have changed because now that standard Mandarin is in the schools, increasingly generation after generation of school children are speaking Mandarin. But I will get into later how it's starting to affect the traditional native languages within China. So, in addition to Mandarin, one of the other major varieties of Chinese is known as Cantonese and is spoken mainly around the area of Guangzhou, also known as Canton, hence Cantonese. But it is also the de facto major variety of Chinese in Hong Kong and Macau. Those are the two um, special administrative regions that used to be um, dependencies of European countries. So in Hong Kong, the official, one of the, the official languages are Chinese and English, but the law doesn't specify which Chinese. But in practice, people speak Cantonese, the news broadcasts are in Cantonese, the spoken language in schools is Cantonese. So if one compares Hong Kong and mainland China, they have very different linguistic situations. And one thing that has become clear is that Cantonese has become a defining sense of identity for Hong Kong people, because unlike 
mainland China, their main variety is not spoken Mandarin. It is spoken Cantonese. And even though they may write formal documents in standard Chinese, people have started having written Cantonese in their day-to-day -day life. And one thing is clear is a well, language is part of who you are. Language is our culture, it's our identity. So with that out of the way, it is a complex situation. So forgive me if some, th some things are unclear, but with that out of the way, I lived in Shenzhen, which is predominantly Mandarin speaking, but I collaborated with Wikipedia users in Hong Kong across the border where the primary language is Cantonese. And further complicating this, I'm an international. I'm not like a Chinese citizen. I'm not a permanent resident of Hong Kong. I was an American working abroad in mainland China. So how does a user group accommodate linguistic variety? How does it accommodate not only different people in the Chinese speaking world, but also people from other languages and backgrounds? So the Hong Kong user group has English and Cantonese as its official languages. And so when you look at the official paperwork filed by the Hong Kong user group, the English version is the primary version of record. So if there are differences between written English and written Chinese versions, the written English is the authoritative version. That makes sense because it collaborates internationally. And so English is probably the best language to use to in formal communication and collaboration. But when it comes down to actually discussing meat and potato issues among the user group members, Cantonese is used. And it makes sense because as a mother tongue, people know how best to express themselves. They know um, there's there a rich variety of like jokes and social situations and humor. And I've heard Cantonese is very, very rich in wordplay. There's a way to you know, break the ice between people who are from the same cultural background. And I think it's also a matter of comfort because when you are around your native language, you feel comfortable, you feel at home. And as an international, you have to think, what is your role? I, I am a, one of the um, directors of the Hong Kong group, but at the same time, I do not know the primary spoken language. <laughs> so the user group was very generous and kind. What the members decided was this. So they discussed in Cantonese, they have lengthy discussions in Cantonese, and I sit back. Then one of the users says, in English, a summary. So they accommodate internationals by summarizing, a reasonable accommodation, I must add, by summarizing the various developments that they discussed. And so both parties win. The, the people, the, the Hong Kong people get to use the language they are most comfortable with rather than a language that they may feel limited in or overly formal or uncomfortable with. And yet at the same time, I get an idea of what the major developments are and I can use that in my planning. And I feel, and they don't have to expend so much energy to accommodate me. So I, I feel, I'm, and I must add, I'm very grateful and is, I'm very happy that this arrangement was made. So on top of that, the Hong Kong user group um, accommodated different audiences depending upon the occasion. So if almost everybody in the room was a local of Hong Kong, Cantonese was used as the language of language of presentations and discussions. But there was another time where I took students from the university I taught at, Southern University of Science and Technology, Nan Fang Keji Da Xue, Nan Feng Fu Ge Dai Hok. And I took, I traveled with them across the border to Hong Kong and they came to learn about how Wikipedia, how to edit Wikipedia, why Wikipedia is important and the culture of Wikipedia they were accommodated with Mandarin. So they had a special presentation done in Mandarin. And I was also involved in the Women in Art Edit-a-thons. And in those edit-a-thons, the participants were, uh, were heavily internationals with some Hong Kong locals and some Chinese mixed in. So English was the medium of discussion in those groups. So the user group was very flexible in how they use language to accommodate different parties depending upon who is participating, what the mission 
of what the mission of the presentation was about. And so if you have a mixed company of mainland and Hong Kong editors, English was also used as kind of a neutral language because mm -hmm. if you use one language, the other party may feel, hey, you know, I feel like I'm being left out. And Mandarin is, uh, mainland Chinese feel very strongly about Mandarin. Hong Kong people feel very strongly about Cantonese, but English is a neutral medium that both parties can accommodate. Having said that, there are mainland Chinese who do know Cantonese. So I took a mainland student who was in my English class at SUSTEC, that's the short form of the university's name. I took her to a Hong Kong meetup and it was the um, Asian month presentation. And so they asked her in English, do you know Cantonese? She said, yes. And I could tell that she really enjoyed the presentation. She understood, even though I didn't know Cantonese, she knew. And I could see her like laugh along the jokes and she really en enjoyed it. So there are situations where you may have somebody who's an international or from a different background, but they do know the predominant native language. And so you can just use the native language to accommodate them. So now that we have the linguistic situation out of the day, I'm sorry, out of the way. Let's talk about Cantonese. So Cant as I've said before, Cantonese is very important to the identity of the Hong Kong people. And it's not only used, it's an entertainment, it's used in their culture, uh, food items are known. And so uh, there is an unfortunate change that is happening. So as many of you may know, the uh, government of the PRC government, the mainland government is starting to pressure Hong Kong authorities into making Mandarin and not Cantonese the language of education. So previously in schools, children use Cantonese as the language they grow up with, the language their teachers speak, the language they, they speak in, the language they think in. Because I remember growing up in the United States, I had a classmate who said he thought in Spanish. So he was in an English medium school, but his thought processes were in Spanish. And likewise, the thought processes of Hong Kongers are in Cantonese. But now the Chinese government is trying to change that, change their language. And so in doing so, it's, it takes away a part of our humanity, our culture. By losing language, you are losing your culture. You are losing a part of yourself. And I had a Hong Kong colleague at SUSTEC, and I, she was saying, well, our language will survive for a little while longer, but I could hear kind of a sadness in her voice. And I, I think I knew and she knew that, you know, language was in danger. So we at the, you know, in the Wikipedia movement need to find a way to stop language loss. We need to find a way to preserve languages so they are actively used and remain viable in the future. And so that is one reason why the Wikimedia Foundation, the Wikimedia movement, promotes the use of native languages. And this goes beyond Hong Kong. Uh, in Taiwan, the language of education and the media is historically Mandarin Chinese, just like it is across the Taiwan Strait in the mainland. But the mother tongue of many Taiwanese is Minnan. And so it used to be that the government in Taiwan under Chiang Kai-shek suppressed the use of the local native and indigenous languages in Taiwan. But since the late 1980s, things have changed. And now in Taiwan, they promote linguistic diversity. They have announcements um, in Minan in the subways. And so now, um, as many of us know, there are accommodations for Minan and different projects promoting the use of not only Minan, but also indigenous Taiwanese languages. And I'm very, you know, I'm very excited to see a commitment to linguistic diversity. But we have to educate users that, you know, this is important, that their languages are a method of communicating information. So it, I'll tell you another story. In one of the Hong Kong meetups, I had a student. He was from um, Hunan province, an inland Chinese province, and he spoke Mandarin and what they call Hunan Hua, the local spoken variety of language in Hunan. And so a Hong Kong user suggested, hey, let's work on the Miss Hong Kong article. So I said to the student, why don't you write Miss Hong Kong in Hunan Hua? 
write it in your local language. But he told me that's not an appropriate language to use to write an article in. You should write only in standard Chinese, not in Hunan Hua. Now, do we all agree with that? Raise our hand. <laughs> I thought so. So we have realized that, you know, for example, Egyptian Arabic, Balinese, the languages are all valid. They're all, they're all valid. They're all um, important. They're all equal. And I'll get to that, equal. And so we need to edu educate people and say, yes, it is appropriate to write an encyclopedia article in your native language. Yes, you, you, should, you should not see it as beneath or below another language, as Occitan used to be seen beneath French, or Nahuatl used to be seen beneath Spanish, or nowadays, like Hunan Hua or Cantonese were seen below standard Chinese. All languages are equal here in this movement. And so I want to uh, close off with some recommendations. So first, recommendations to the WMF and the movement. Make sure all linguistic backgrounds are ac accommodated reasonably as much as possible. And if you look in the back of the wall right there, you see the uh, various uh, topics are in multiple languages, Indonesian, Korean, Chinese, et cetera. And so I think we're doing a very good job in accommodating the various languages that um, we all not only speak, but also think in, read in, write in, and live in. And so for other user groups, you need to take stock of your participants to, to ensure which languages are um, accommodated. So you may run a group in Indonesia, and then suddenly somebody from Japan shows up and he knows some English, Japanese is his mother tongue, and he doesn't know Bahasa Indonesia. So how are you gonna accommodate him and help him get, you know, help him like become involved in your user group and participate? Or it could be somebody from another part of Indonesia. And if English is not the majority language and some international participants are pre present, you could use some like summaries, you can summarize major developments, or you could ask them to do a particular part of a presentation in English. So after um, ECAP in Bangkok, the uh, one uh, Hong Kong user did a presentation of his part in Cantonese, but then I did the presentation of my part in English. And so that way, both languages were accommodated depending upon who was speaking, which languages the other participants know, how you can best express yourself in. And user groups could also advertise their um, activities in multiple languages. So you could advertise not only in Chinese, you could advertise in English. And in Hong Kong, there are other uh, South and Southeast Asian languages spoken by inhabitants. You could advertise in Punjabi, you could advertise in Thai or Vietnamese. And so you can get a broad range of people from various backgrounds who are saying, oh, I saw this I saw the ad for this. This looks really cool. And so by using multiple languages, you can get a diverse base of people and get many ways of thinking and expressing themselves. And I will reemphasize, all languages are equal. And then to international, such as myself, one of the most important recommendations for international participants, please respect the use of native and mother languages. Not everything needs to be in English. You don't, you don't want to overly stress the people you work with and have them translate everything or do everything at the expense of, you know, their resources and their well-being and their right to self-determination in their own language. And it, that's why, you, why it's important for internationals to, you know, take stock and figure out what is a reasonable accommodation for me. And try to learn some aspects of the native languages so you kind of understand some of the thought processes. You don't need to be totally fluent, but you do need to think, you need to get the basis. How is the language structured? How do people think? So in many of my classes in Shenzhen, I notice people mix up the words he and she. But if you under, but an understanding of Mandarin shows why, because the words for he and she are written differently, but they are pronounced the same. Ta, ta lao shi. Ta chir fan, whether it a uh, male or female. And so that's why in speech a lot of Mandarin speakers mix up the words he and she. And so in knowing that, I, you know, I say, oh, it's okay, I forgive you. 
you know, you, you get a sense of sympathy and you kind of understand how and why linguistic mistakes happen. And lastly, but not leastly, it's important to learn more about the culture and the environment that you operate in. Learn about the history, the politics, and the current developments wherever you are. So thank you. I really apologize for the... Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comment on this? We be in. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Vivian from the Movement Sharing Governance Team from the Foundation here. I can only say I really appreciate your presentation and I can really resonate um, with a lot of part of it because one of my, I see as my daily struggle is in terms of explaining the, well, the Chinese language itself to uh, various different people because I find it difficult to actually find balance that as a native Mandarin speaker, that I find it insensitive uh, myself to say, oh, Chinese when I speak in English, because it feels like ignoring language diversity itself and could also potentially um, indicate some colonial baggage in that sense. At the same time, I find it like for other people who doesn't speak Mandarin uh, to be able to actually understand what I'm talking about, I kind of have to tell people, yeah, Chinese, uh, yeah, Chinese interpretation is what we're doing for this time, right? Um, so that is a question has been on my mind and I'm also thinking about because in our uh, communication, I was also, I got asked, like, how do we, do we actually use Mandarin or Chinese in like, you know, foundation communication and so on? And to be honest, I, I don't know, I'm in two minds and I actually would really love to know more about your thoughts because I, it, it is to me, it's a balance of being respectful to language diversity at the same time for people outside of uh, who, who speak this language to understand. And another part, I just want to really like, thank you for um, raising awareness on uh, language diversity here, because like, um, yeah, as you share, like, um, as growing up in Taiwan, like my parents uh, go through a generation that they suffer from not able to, um, they get punished for speaking their mother tongue. And um, my generation suffer from, I mean, I actually feel ashamed to say that I, I don't actually write one of my uh, mother tongue. And I'm just happy to see that um, for the younger generation that they get a chance to learn that in school system. I feel a bit emotional, um, but yeah, I think this topic really resonates with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian. Um, yes. Yep, so two things. So first of all, I really like that this makes a point that yesterday we had a presentation in the own languages. I think it's in the New Zealand, Indonesian, and the traditional Taiwanese. And the, the Jiang Xi, who was the other Korean like participant, he's in other session probably, but like the he was intended to do English because we I we thought like that we have to force to do something in English. But like the what I and I advise and helping them to just prepare the session, I give some advice, but like the what I learned from this is we don't need to, seriously. We can just like, even like the, we can provide the translations in the presentation or I can just helping, assisting him while I was at other session, probably because of the, I hope was important, honestly, but yes. So I think, so this is very important things to do in the future, in the conference, Wikimania and the other events. So I thinking, so, there was the Mumas communications they're doing the volunteer translations network. We are to attempt, and I'm part of it after I left, left the foundation. So what we attempt to do is we try to translate, to like the, try to let the local peoples who are not understanding English can understand everything without like the annoying knowledge about English. So that could be, should be improved and the should be, that's very, very huge, important part. So. I want to point out that, so the thank you for presentation. There's no question, but yeah, I want to really raise this point. Thank you so much, Annie, yep. Yeah, uh, I'm Johnny from the Philippines. Um, I'm not Chinese, but I have, uh, I have uh, Spanish extraction and the Spanish community and the Chinese have always been culturally side by side, even geographically in the settlements. Uh, but anyway, I'm trying to say this because uh, uh, 
at present, the two, we have a 2% population of Chinese in our country, and 45% of the billionaires in the Philippines are Chinese. But the language they speak is Hokkien. Uh, I am not aware whether there is a Hokkien language Wikipedia project. Is there yes, one? Yes. Because uh, that would that would be a very very good avenue for people in my country to express themselves and to and to share their legacy. Sorry to a little to uh, to return to your issue, the Fukian language. May, there may, may be a little dif minor difference, but it's the Minnan language. The Huan Yi, Huan Yang, I was standing on the stage to say, and Minnan language, yes, we have a Wikipedia, and there currently uh, are many people writing on this. It's in using the Taiwan, Tai Tai Lu, how to writing methods and yeah so you can try to find the Binan language Linnan language Wikipedia and you'll find it thank you so much thank you so much Jesse thank you um we have a couple of minutes left before closing the session I would just like to share that um there is a language diversity hub in the making uh uh uh, along with ECF Hub, which is which which is why we're gathered here, and I invite you to have a look at the Meta Wiki page for the Language Diversity Hub. Um, I'm a part of that. We have um, user Iumu from uh, Taiwan, also a part of that uh, hub, and uh, we've recently conducted and finished research on the needs of small language Wikipedias. Uh, one of them was Paiwanese uh, Wikipedia, for instance, and Kashmiri Wikipedia for from India. Uh, and with that. I would like to close. Uh, I would like to present some souvenirs to the uh, presenters today.